And now, one or two years later, in 1803, 1804, we come to the C major sonata, opus 53, the so-called Waldstein sonata, because it's dedicated to Count Ferdinand von Waldstein, who had been a great mentor and uh, sponsor of Beethoven already from his early days in Bonn, when Beethoven left his birthplace, Bonn, and went to Vienna, then Count Waldstein wrote a dedication in his notebook that may you go to Vienna and inherit Mozart's spirit from Haydn's hand. Mozart just died in, in 1791, and this is when Beethoven arrives in Bonn, and Haydn is still there. So Count Waldstein was a very early supporter and friend of, of Beethoven's. Um, again, there is nothing programmatic about this sonata, and it's one of the most popular and well-loved sonatas. But I cannot speak highly enough of this composition and, and um, with the deepest admiration. And it's one of the sonatas I learned last because I heard it too many times and uh, um, also a lot of times not so well. And often when I was a young man I said, you know, what's the fuss about this sonata? Uh, and I must say when I learn it and the older I get I realize that this is not just one of the greatest sonatas of Beethoven, but it's one of the greatest pieces of music there is. And it's also it's a, it's a milestone in the history of, of music and the history of piano music, the way to write for the keyboard, the, the way to write for the piano orchestrally. Uh, to think of new ways of of, of achieving effects of sound that had not been approached before, not by Beethoven and not by anybody else. Yeah. Let's play a little bit. That's the exposition, 
And I went back to the repeat because, again, this is vitally important. Um, so you can see the, the whole spectrum of, of, of the sound has increased enormously. And again, a very unorthodox beginning. He starts this time on the tonic, C major, but, but we have a, a rhythmic motive, this, this knocking, repeated quavers. This, and harmonically, and then, again, let's, let's remember, this descending tone. Uh, and then comes a, this is a motive here, a question and a very varied answer. But again, Beethoven uses the registers of, of the piano, the bass, the middle, and, and the top with incredible uh, effect and, and imagination. Uh, also then, this figuration, which is the variation of this. So, tremolando, it's, it's a very, very new pianistic effect, but those of you who, who know orchestra and string quartet, you can get that very well on the, on the string instruments, this tremolando effect. Uh, and now, instead of going a step down, uh, then uh, he is ascending now, one step up. Uh, comes this bridge passage. And also new in this sonata is that the second theme, the second subject, comes in this, in this heavenly E major. So a, a third related key. But this is again modeled on the G major sonata. G major, and the second theme was in B major, a third higher. So here, C major. And, uh, uh, again, Schubert used this kind of tonal harmonic relationship very often. Uh, when we get to this second subject, which is like a chorale. Uh, we should again concentrate on, on the rhythm. So it's in, in slow motion, but it's in pam, pa, pa, pam, 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 pa, pa, pam, like a... A dactyl and, and a spondylus, you know? So you worry. I, I put an accent on this B natural because that's what Beethoven wrote. Yeah. Luckily, I just brought this um, to. Uh, it's wonderful to have a, an autograph of Beethoven, which is luckily. Published and it's one of one of the clearer manuscripts of Beethoven. There are astonishingly few corrections in it. But for example, it's very important to see that he wrote this forzando in, under that tone, that B natural, which is in the middle voice. Uh, there is also on the first page of this manuscript there is a nota bene. 
and he says here in German, I'm saying this in English now, that when I write the letters P-E-D dot pedal, that means that you have to push down both the pedals. Now, we have to remember in Beethoven's time, they were often divided. On the sustaining pedal, there was a cut in the middle, so you could, you could pedal for the base of the piano and the upper part of the piano. But Beethoven says here, deliberately, when I write P-E-D, then press down both the pedals for both the bass and, and the discount. And when I write a circle, an empty circle, that means release it again. This sonata is full of these instructions. Here is the manuscript, so we are not just talking in fantasies. Many performers today say, yes, we know, but it doesn't matter, <laughs> because the piano today is different from Beethoven's piano, and you have to do it. Uh, I think this argument is not good enough. Uh, these are great revolutionary ideas by Beethoven. When he writes the beginning of the last movement, and then he wants a wash of sound. He does not want something clinically, pedantically clean in every change of harmony. And whether you play it on a modern piano or an old piano, I think the idea is what matters. And I just don't like to hear that, yes, on, on a modern piano, you should not do it. Um, so let's go back now to the second subject of the first movement, when he puts a... Uh, So the chorale goes to the left hand, and there is this wonderful counterpoint in, in triplet motion. And the triplets become more and more important because at the beginning we had repeated quavers. And so on. the triplet is, is the main theme and against that you have these, these horn syncopations Is, is the most brilliant sonata of, of all the Beethoven sonatas, I would think, and certainly up to this point. Um, then comes the last theme. We know. Again, it's, it's dactylic. Tam, pa, pa, pam, pa, pa, pam, pa, pa, pam. And with this theme, Beethoven can modulate just about anywhere. And now comes the development. But, but with this motive, you could just... Um, for half an hour. Uh, but let's see what happens now in this wonderful development section.
see, he uses this, uh, those two little calls. And this is really, really symphony orchestra. All the different sections and instruments are playing. Again, a wonderful note in the autograph. The F, F flat in the bass. Modern editions corrected this. It's so much beautiful than today in printed versions you get. Uh, you hear the difference? It's a very difficult subject, this, of editions. Uh, now, the Henle edition is, is really a wonderful edition. Now there is a new, new Henle edition. I'm making publicity for them, <laughs> which is being prepared, and Opus 31 appeared. Uh, it's done by my friend and colleague, Mari Peraya, and it's a wonderful edition, so, but they are not down to the Waldstein yet. <laughs> uh, so let's see what happens now. C major, which is the tonic of the sonata, but psychologically, we feel f far removed from it. We don't, we don't have a, a home feeling, and it is not a home feeling structurally. <laughs> from, from this theme. Uh, comes a, a very intricate polyphonic counterpuntal section. <laughs> After all this fighting and storm with, with all these accents and sforzandi, it's really full of fighting spirit. And the storm lets down, and now we reach the dominant. And then pianissimo from a distance comes this, this murmur. This is really a, a magical moment. It's, a, it's like a force of nature, like a sunrise, or like a, a creation, like, like in, in, in Haydn's creation when the, when the light comes out. I feel. First there was chaos. This emergence, emerging of, of the sun. And it's a wonderful movement 
when a... it's hard to hear but when the this progression of C C sharp and D Yes, so then comes the recapitulation, and uh, let's just speak a moment about the, the coda, because it's, it's a, this is a gigantic movement. Uh, um, again, it's, it's in the, it starts in the Napolitan key, C major. It's very remote. First time the answer comes very dramatically. Uh, there are all sforzandos on, on the second beats. Uh, cadenza out of, of a big piano concerto and then uh, just a little two scales and uh, is, uh, this wonderful second theme at last in the home key but in different registers Give you the last note. <laughs> then in the minor, and the third time, major again. And now he releases it. After this, Beethoven wrote a wonderful movement, Andante Favori, that when he played the piece for his friends, everybody thought it did not fit into the sonata. They found it very beautiful, but out of proportion and too long. Beethoven was furious. He did not take criticism very well. Nor do we. <laughs> but mm, he listened to, to this criticism, and, and rightly so. Luckily, he left us the Andante Favori. glorious piece of music and I will play it I always play it as an encore after the sonata to show that the first version of this piece uh, but we can see that Beethoven was really wise to listen to his friends this time and he left out the Andante Favori instead he wrote a much shorter second movement an intermezzo, an introduzione, adagio molto, extremely slow. And it is like, a, like an intermezzo, like a preparation for the finale. And you will hear, or 
you have heard many times, but if you think about it, that one of the glories of this sonata is the transition between the second and the third movements, which, uh, which is one of the most magical things in music. And I just don't know, I cannot imagine how Beethoven would have solved it with the Andante Favori. So this movement is a very philosophical, penserioso thinking very deeply. So he kept the tonality F major of this, but, but it is a wonderfully ambiguous movement because you, you don't really notice that you are in F major until about the tenth bar. We start in F, but already here. We are far away from the. Again, you should always follow the progression of the bass. Then dominant. And then we are really in F major. So until here, we had speaking. Now comes the singer. echoed by other voices. this song and back to the beginning. It's a very dark moment. Um, then comes a variation of the first part and it gets more and more dramatic and then I should not really say anything, you just listen to it. Um.
Yes, this is the this wonderful final movement, rondo. Again, the, the marking is allegretto moderato. Really not fast. I don't know why some people are rushing here like they have a train to catch. <laughs> and it's a very, it's a very moderate movement. Then in the end it will have a, a presto finale and then you can really let go. But if you play the whole movement too fast then that presto loses its function. Uh, so as you see you had this transition and the last note of, of the slow movement is a G which has a sforzando mark and then starts, the, the theme of the last movement starts with the first bass note. So it... Uh, they belong together. They are not two different things. And you will see later that this is structurally very important. Uh, I spoke already about the pedaling and there are really enormously long passages when, when C major and C minor are washed together. So you see the And then comes a passage where he writes this empty circle. So take off the pedal and then one has to play without pedal but legato. And back to the pedal. Pedal, pedal, no pedal. And here you have this new pianistic device which is very very difficult even today and Beethoven writes another nota bene here that for people who find this too difficult then they can leave certain notes out. <laughs> <laughs> but really you have to trill with uh, and you have to play the it's very tricky. And um, so this, this was the first part of the rondo. Now comes the first episode, which is symphonic, and it's like a, like a Russian country dance. <laughs> Again, do you hear this, this uh, wash of sound? And he wants this in one pedal. One. And 
going back to the rondo. Then, after he repeats the whole A part, comes the second episode again in, in minor key and very dramatic, very urgent. <laughs> This is very typically heroic Beethoven of, of the third symphony, of the fifth symphony, the fighting, this, the wrestling Beethoven. Uh, it should not be beautiful, it doesn't matter, it has to be true. And then he closes this section and comes. We have this hope motive again. <laughs> Not for nothing the French call this sonata l'aurore, aurora, dawn, yes? So. <laughs> is the point of the golden mean. D flat major, the Napolitan key, and now comes this wonderful transition passage of looking for the exit syncopations. think that this is a Czerny etude where one plays wonderful arpeggi, but listen to the bass. Yum, pa, um, pa. How was the beginning? So that's what's important. The arpeggi are secondary. modulations and this, these are all the original pedalings of Beethoven and it's all in pianissimo. Uh, so then we are on the threshold of the recapitulation. Of Outburst. Uh, then 
back comes the first episode, but extended and even more orchestral. Look. Tutti, everybody playing with whatever they have. Uh, so then, at the end of this section, he's repeating the the, how, the main rhythm. I mean, it's it's very good that Schoenberg later used this terminology, Hauptrhythmus, the main rhythm. He it abbreviates it with HP. Mm. which is prestissimo and now you can really play fast Yum. rhythm Now those of you who play the piano this is a very much disputed passage because in the manuscript you can see Beethoven writes pianissimo, legato arch, and the fingering, one five, one five for each octave. And this obviously means a glissando to be executed in octaves. And again, Many pianists today say, oh yes, this was easy on Beethoven's piano, but on today's piano it's a, uh, is the old song again. And, well, you need to have a wonderful piano, and that is also one, one reason why I bring my own pianos now. I didn't for the last few concerts, but I regretted it. And... It's very difficult to explain to people why, why is the Wigmore piano not, not good for him and why is he so fussy. The, <laughs> the Wigmore piano is a wonderful instrument, but if you have the possibility to play on your own piano, it's like sleeping in your own bed. <laughs> it would be very nice to bring your bed everywhere with you in each hotel. So, anyway... Many pianists, they, they use the pedal and then play this passage, which, which is very brilliant, but it's, it's pure cheating. <laughs> and so you must have a sympathetic piano that can play this. Again, 
he is using this device of the trill and the melody together. And uh, how beautifully he modulates, even in this very virtuoso coda.